All right, guys, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, it seems like we're having some technical difficulties where the video isn't working. So we'll do this as an audio only uh, audio only bit. Uh, I'm here with uh, Amias uh, Garrity from QED and uh, Julie, uh, who works with the FinTech today. Um, thanks for joining us, guys. Oh, glad to be here. Uh, Julie and I are super excited. I know that, uh, you know, I think we should just dive in. We, we have a lot of questions and uh, um, yeah, so, Amayas, tell us a little bit about your background. I know that you were uh, an ex-regulator, now you're a QED. I think it'd be really useful for the audience to kind of get some uh, get some insight into you know what you've done in the past. Sure. So um, I guess maybe in reverse order. So I'm a partner at QED Investors. We are an early stage financial services focused venture capital firm. We you know primarily do Series A, and that we like to invest in businesses with revenue. Um, but we will go, um, we'll go earlier and, uh, and we'll go a little bit later. We, you know, luckily for us, we raised a, a recently raised a large fund pre COVID and, uh, and we're sort of, you know, very active across the entire uh, financial services landscape. We've been around over a decade and, uh, you know, pretty proud of the track record. I've been at QED just for three years. Before that, I was at the U.S. Treasury Department, and I joined the U.S. Treasury Department at literally the height of the financial crisis. So I joined on the very first day of the Obama administration. Two weeks in, I remember uh, uh, Timothy Geithner, the Treasury Secretary at the time, gave a live speech about crisis response, and the Dow uh, dropped 200 points in 15 minutes as he was talking. So, so I've been I've been through that roller coaster before, and when COVID hit, I spent probably 10 or 12 hours a week on the phone with various people, you know, taking on the second or third job of uh, not just helping my portfolio companies, but uh, thinking of, you know, the congressional response and the policy response uh, inside the government as, a, as another portfolio company that needed attending to. So, so that's the, the basics of my background. And, and when I joined uh, Treasury, the first 18 months I wrote, uh, you know, it was part of a team of 20 or 30 people that wrote Dodd Frank, and uh, one of very few people who uh, stayed from a blank sheet of paper stage through to uh, full implementation. So that's that's the basics of of what I've been doing, and um, mostly have invested in financial infrastructure and back office software uh, type of companies inside of fintech. Yeah, I know you led the uh, Treasury Prime round recently, which uh, you know I'm a I'm a big fan of theirs. So that that's super interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, from an investor perspective in fintech, you know, how, how what have you been seeing, uh, you know, post COVID? Has anything like any trends or anything been particularly surprising? Yeah, I think there's probably two things that that are surprising, uh, and one thing that's probably worth noting, but it's not really surprising. So let, let me start with the thing that's not surprising. When you have a crisis that forces everyone to be inside you really get clarity on the digitization trend. Uh, and that message has been heard loud and clear by people who were not, not so uh, on board or, or were finding reasons to not prioritize it because it is in fact quite difficult. So one of our portfolio companies called Amount, uh, which is a lending as a service and digital onboarding uh, for regional banks, you know, they describe this as a decade of digital transformation that's going to get squeezed into six months, six to 12 months. So I don't think that's surprising, but, but I think it's good news for the fintech ecosystem. Um, the, the thing that I think, two, two things that are surprising, uh, one is that there are businesses that are more counter cyclical than we expected. And I think in our portfolio, uh, broadly speaking, the kind of the neobank businesses are, are doing just better than, than you might have thought. I think I would have at, uh, thought 12 months ago that a neobank was kind of a nice to have business that, you know, when people were feeling good, uh, feeling good about their finances, they would be looking for new ways to engage digitally and have better user experience, but that those businesses might end up being pretty cyclical in terms of growth mm -hmm. rate. And I think much to our surprise and frankly to our delight, those businesses have really turned out to be uh, counter cyclical. Um, now, partly that's probably to the, the earlier point about digitization, um, but in our portfolio, uh, we have a, a neobank company called Current. It turns out Current's 
modal customer is an essential worker who works for Amazon or works for DoorDash. And those people are not just doing more business, they're actually, um, they're working harder, they have more need, and, and they're still employed. And that, that means that current, uh, because, in part because they offer people access to their paychecks uh, more quickly, um, they are, they're cleaning up, they're really accelerating growth. So that's exciting. Another um, neobank and financial wellness platform, financial advice platform in our portfolio is called Albert, and they're seeing similar dynamics. So, so I think that is um, an example where there are businesses that are countercyclical that we did not necessarily expect to be countercyclical. There are other businesses uh, like Zoom, uh, right? The countercyclicality is not a surprise. I think right. the third thing, which is a little bit surprising and quite difficult as an investor, is that we're also seeing businesses where revenue is down, but customer growth is way up. So in other words, these are businesses that have transactional volume mm -hmm. um, and they get paid by transaction. Transactions are down, but um, the force of digitization means that those businesses are seeing an acceleration from a customer growth perspective. And I think as an investor, that is, that is really difficult to value and it's difficult to coach um, CEOs on because we generally see customer growth and revenue growth moving uh, in a highly correlated manner. And in this environment, we're seeing them move in a non-correlated manner. And I think that's a really challenging and interesting dynamic for us as investors and as board members and coaches and advisors to our CEOs. Yeah, as a follow-up question, are these, is these, like, for these businesses, are this, is this customer growth uh, sticky or is it fickle? Is it something that you think will stick around post COVID or is it something that um, you are just seeing a temporary, you think you're just seeing a temporary bump from? Very much TBD. I think for, for our companies, this is, um, this is something that, that we expect to end up being sticky, right? COVID creates an, an emergency but once you use that emergency to digitize a core part of your process or to demonstrate that digitization is possible, um, we think that will be sticky even if the contract is nominally about COVID. And so, so I'll give two examples. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one example in our portfolio is a company called Ocrelis. Ocrelis is a data extraction and analytics company. So what they do is they help people automate document-driven workflows. And so naturally PPP was a big opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. And they had huge customer growth, very big customers that they'd never dealt with before. Um, you know, at one point they did 100,000 PPP applications in a weekend just for one of their customers. So when, when you hear about that, now will that customer have that kind of volume post COVID? It's not clear. But when you have a partner that delivers that kind of success on that kind of a time frame we think that'll end up being sticky. Another example, and this is not from our portfolio, but comes from a large regional bank that we were talking to. And uh, the CEO of this regional bank said to us, hey, you know, we just did a partnership with a FinTech um, because we needed to digitize something for COVID. And it's really opened our eyes to how it is possible when you prioritize to do something well and to do something fast. And I think for, especially for these large regional banks, even at the CEO level, that can be a very illuminating and empowering insight. Something done well and done fast. That's not often the case um, for these very large corporations, even when you're the CEO. And I think that is another, um, my guess is that partnership that he was talking about will become sticky and that that bank's attitude towards digitization um, will be different coming out of COVID and they'll probably be more willing to do more partnerships more quickly. And I think that's really encouraging for the ecosystem. Yeah, Amaya, right. I had a question kind of following on this a little bit. You mentioned um, at the start of that, that digitization has kind of, it's gonna be about 10 years worth of stuff in six to 12 months. Is regulation ready for that though? Or is regulation gonna to have to just be sped up quite dramatically as well? Yeah, so Julie, this is a great question and I'm, I'm glad you asked it. I have, um, what I would call extremely contrarian views about regulation and innovation. I broadly think that uh, innovation puts relatively little pressure on most regulation. Um, most regulation, certainly at the level of the law, is uh, 
is, is quite technology agnostic. Um, and so in the, in the main, uh, the, the regulations that are hard to deal with from an innovation perspective are regulations that are risk oriented. So they'll say things like, you know, if you third party risk management, the fundamental principle of third party risk management is don't do something that could imperil a core part of your business without treating it like you're taking a core risk. And so if you're going to move to cloud, if you're going to move your whole core to the cloud, that is quasi existential for a bank. And so what the regulator says, don't do something that creates an existential risk without thinking about it like an existential risk. Now that gets translated to core to cloud providers as, hey, the regulators are preventing us from moving to the cloud. But I think the, the honest truth is here that when banks want to do something, um, the regulators want them to do it in a more technologically effective way, um, but they want to do it, them to do it carefully and in a way that doesn't fail. And so I, I don't think um, realistically this is going to put all that much pressure on, on actual regulation. I think it will put cultural pressure on the supervisors, um, but that can be worked through much more easily than changing law or changing regulation. Got it. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, obviously right before this happened, I think, or maybe like right at the onset, Square got approved for their banking license. Do you think we see more of that? Or do you think we're going to continue to see more of those like uh, behind the scenes relationships that other neobanks um, typically have? Yeah, this is, um, I think we will see more. I'm not sure how quickly. So Square is a good example here. Vero Bank is a good example. But they're also good examples because what, what they do prove and what they don't prove. So I think what they do prove is an openness to give charters to innovative companies. But that openness in both of those cases was companies with um, multi-product, very developed risk management, um, very developed business models and strong capital positions. And I think in the... Um, if you think about the question of will fintechs become banks, well, the average fintech is unprofitable, monoline, and growing at, you know, 100 or 200% a year. And it is just not in the culture or in the, or frankly, in the best interest of the banking system to give um, government guarantees to businesses that are monoline, unprofitable, and go, growing at 200% a year. Um, now, you could argue with that as a framework, um, but I think what, what we're going to see here is um, there needs to be a better meeting of the minds between what it means to be a bank and, um, and, and, and the benefits and the obligations that come with that. So, so I think there will be more, but I think it, it, will, not, um, it will not change overnight because the fundamental standards are not going to change. Bank regulators want banks that are um, have diverse businesses that are profitable, that are self-sustaining, um, and they're uncomfortable with 200 you know, percent a year growth. And um, so, so that's always going to be a challenge. I do think, though, that the opportunities for partnership and the opportunities for participation um, in, in sort of government programs or government engagement uh, will be very benefited by the PPP experience, both because regulators realized that the fintechs really were a lot better at lending than they expected. Um, and hopefully they'll realize that, that the fintech lenders that got involved in the PPP were actually effective in terms of, you know, fraud and other risk characteristics. Um, so they got, so, so my hope is that they'll, that it will find that the fintech lenders that got involved were much more effective on speed and just as effective on risk. And I think that kind of insight um, will, will give access to things like the SBA, things like the CDFI program, things that are not about giving government guarantees, but are about closer engagement between um, regulators and regulated entities and fintechs. And I think also um, will open the door more in terms of partnerships um, so that, that fintech partnerships between uh, banks and fintechs are are seen in, in a more positive and successful light. Um, 
Thanks for that. I, I have a couple questions about, uh, you know, PVP and, uh, you know, the, around what's what's been going on with COVID. I think over the last couple months, I think there's, in the weeks, there's been a bit of a, of a focus between uh, relationship with regulators and uh, fintech companies in the U.S. Um, I think, you know, starting off with PPP loans, but also like the dis direct disbursements to consumers. Um, in regards to PPP, is there something that you think uh, we could have done differently or did it highlight um you know in your opinion a new problem for startups to tackle i think uh you know we've talked about it before but you know the general consensus seems to be that pvp was kind of you know the at least the first rollout was definitely uh pretty difficult and then uh the second one seems to be a little bit a little bit more smooth yeah so i think ppp did pretty well considering its design Mm -hmm. um, but, but my view is that credit was a poor instrument. And so what they tried to do is do a grant program through the, the framework of credit. And um, they also chose to work with banks um, when they were really trying to give companies, um, you know, money to survive. And I think that the fundamental challenge there is that um, commercial arrangements are not designed um, to create completeness and they're not designed to create fairness, right? A bank, you know, when you, when you give someone a profit motive, you're not asking them to give money to the most needy businesses. You're asking them to give money to the businesses that they want to do business with. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That is the logic of the market. Similarly, when you made the choice to do it um, as a, a loan program through banks, um, you were baking into the cake the idea that achieving completeness would be difficult, if not impossible. There was just no framework for giving it, giving it to every company that, that needed it. Um, and, and so I think it's no surprise what we saw, especially in the first rollout, um, was that the program moved very quickly and, and deserves, some, deserves credit for that. Um, but it, it was not complete. And it was not fair in any sort of traditional understanding of that, the way that my children would talk about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and that, that is just to be expected when, when you don't design a program to be complete or to com be fair, it, it's very difficult to expect that it would be. I think, you know, to, to drill down as, as one small example of this, um, because the, the implementation prioritized speed, and this is not to criticize the speed that they acted at, it meant that um, the banks had more than a week's head start to make these loans over the fintechs. And I and others and anybody who's listening to this call probably knows that it was obvious from the start that doing low dollar loans, $50,000 loans at speed with volume was going to be much more effective if you let the fintechs do it. So Cabbage, PayPal, Square, into it, Gusto. Um, there are so many, um, not, not to mention Bluevine, et cetera. There are just so many great lenders um, who could do smaller dollar loans to needy businesses at real volume and at real speed. Um, but because they did not delay the program start until they had granted some of those companies access to the program, the first round basically had no fintech loans being made. And I think that was, um, that was a real trade-off um, that, that impacted the completeness and the fairness. And you know, I, I'm not sure that it was the wrong trade-off because the, the dominant push was for speed at that time, but even a delay of three or four or five days that allowed fintechs in might've made a big difference in terms of getting loans out to more companies um, while they were still savable. Yeah, that's interesting. I think one, I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk around uh, the fact that COVID has accelerated uh, the non-bank relationship uh, between, well, between non-banks and, and the government, I think. Uh, do you think this is something that uh, a relationship that, that'll develop over time or, and do you think this is permanent? And I think what advice do you have uh, for fintech startups uh, that can develop, to develop a strong relationship with the government to better serve their customers too? Yeah, so um, great question. And I think there, there's two quite different things in there. One is the advice to startups and one is what's going to happen. You know, when I was at Treasury, I used to say, I like talking to fintech startups who know what business they're in and know that business is financial services, not tech. And I, the, the reason I, I say that is that I think sometimes people, in part because of the valuation dynamics, 
they're so focused on being treated as a tech company that they forget that the fundamental thing that they're doing is, is financial services. And when you, when you do that reframing, I think you can, you can start to be very hopeful from the perspective of, you know, what should the government think about fintech? Because what the government should think about fintech is that um, certainly those that are doing direct provision of financial services um, they are just either better or not as good versions um, competing in a marketplace to provide financial services to, to consumers and businesses in this country. And if you have that perspective, then regulators can, can afford to be pretty agnostic from a technology perspective. So I think, um, so I think that's one observation. The second observation is that a, the close of a cycle um, uh, from business cycle perspective will ultimately help fintechs quite significantly because those that survive will no longer have this idea that look when times are good anybody can make uh, good loans the real question is can you survive a can you survive a business cycle um i remember the head of a regulatory agency um said to me once i'll be interested in fintech after they survive a credit cycle mm -hmm. and i think that that is a um it's a little bit of an unfair point but but there, there's some truth to it. And so I think the, the fintechs that survive, for, um, for better or worse, will um, be much more accepted as uh, regular players in the financial services ecosystem. So, and I think that will be good. We, we should not totally think of fintechs as a special category that needs special regulation. Um, and I think that dovetails to the advice that I would give um, fintechs. I often hear pitches from fintechs who say, oh, well, we've developed this great dialogue with regulator X or regulator Y, and therefore we think we're going to win. And I think that is just a fundamental mistake. Um, government will not, will not create winners. Your ability to have a good dialogue with, uh, you know, especially if you're thinking about a reg tech solution, your ability to have dialogue with a regulator is not going to create market power for you as a startup. Um, but at the same time, the um, you know, regulators want to understand what's happening. Innovation is ex just as exciting to regulators as it is to you and to me, and that's why we're, we're focused where we're focused. Um, so what that means in terms of advice is if you're a FinTech who wants to create a dialogue with, with regulators, you have to think of that dialogue as primarily serving a public purpose rather than primarily serving a private purpose. So FinTechs or other companies that come into the government and say, you know, what would really help us would be X. Um, this policy change would really help our business. That is just, it never works. Um, and so they really have to think about governmental engagement as fundamentally thinking, what have we learned based on our business model that is going to make a difference in, in the public interest? And I think if you can bring that perspective there's so much insight to be gained and you have to take a deep breath and you have to look inside for where that insight is. But the regulators are very eager to get that insight, but they're very bored of companies that, um, that want government regulation to change to make their business models easier. Got it. So we have um, a question from Anthony in the Q&A. Um, so he says, with regards to third party risk management, do you see large organizations like banks revisiting their procurement and vendor risk management policies to more quickly adapt to the environment? And if so, does this start to open the floodgates for more taking on for those taking on more risk endeavors? Um, and realizing the benefits of the policy changes does in fact provide untapped utility from the fintech community. Yeah, so I think the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is maybe, right? It is, I think it is obvious that this crisis has meant um, they have pushed certain things through. And when they have pushed those things through, they were able to achieve results. So this is what I, you know, this story about the, the regional bank CEO. Um, and I think that will cause them to, to re recognize that, that you, can, you can push harder. Um, I think the longer answer is that prioritization remains difficult. And one of the functions of third party risk management um, from a bank bureaucratic perspective is that it gives senior bank executives a convenient excuse 
to um, or a convenient method to let other people do the, pri the prioritization for them. So in other words, if I'm the COO or the CFO of a bank and, and you know, executive number one comes to me and says, hey, I'd like to spend $3 million on this tech. And then executive number two comes and says, I'd like to spend $3 million on this. And executive number three, you get the point. Eventually, you have more great projects than you have um, a budget. And if you're the CFO, one way to do this would be to straightforwardly evaluate the projects. But actually, an easy way to do it from a bureaucratic perspective is to tell each of them, well, I want you know, tech to take a hard look at all of these and then come back to me with the ones that have passed our third party risk management. So, so I think that, that you have to take a look at this from a, a bank bureaucracy perspective and understand that um, many of these uh, bureaucratic processes are um, serve not just risk functions, but also prioritization functions. And that does not, th those prioritizations will not go um, away, even if um, people recognize uh, more and more that, that the risk can be managed for top priorities. Uh, that, that was great. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I really appreciate it. We're, uh, we're, at, uh, we're at time now. Um, this was really fun. I uh, have a lot of more questions for you, so definitely need to figure out a way to, to ask you some more down the line. But uh, thanks again for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you, guys.